Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so my name is Rebecca Isaacs, and I'm from uh, Microsoft Research in Silicon Valley. Um, I've been there about um, well, almost two years, and before that I was at Microsoft Research in Cambridge for uh, probably about nine years. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, I guess, a different, uh, a different style from all the previous presentations that you've had. So um, I hope you don't mind, but this is going to be a lot less um, detailed. So it should be a bit easier. You can sit back, relax, just uh, kind of enjoy a little tour of, uh, uh, actually it's a, it's a bit of a history lesson, but I hope that I can um, convey some important ideas that I'd like you to take away. But I'll go into those. Okay, so I'm looking at operating systems here on uh, different types of architecture. So first of all, everybody knows this, but let me just be very clear, what is an operating system? Uh, it's basically the interface between the applications that you run on your computer and the hardware underneath. So at the most basic level, its um, most essential task is to manage resources, to arbitrate who gets what resource um, when there's multiple applications competing for you know, the disk, for example, or the network or whatever, the CPU. Um, and examples of operating systems that you all know and use every day are, of course, Windows and Linux and Mac OS, and there's plenty of others. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing mostly on research operating systems rather than those. Um, so what have distributed systems got to do with operating systems? Um, okay, so you've, you've already heard uh, many times over what a distributed system is. In a distributed system, obviously, we have an operating system running on every computer. So this can actually pan out in two different ways. You can either have um, the operating system on each computer completely independent, and then um, there's some higher level software, the distributed system software, that gives the impression to the application that's running that there's only one, com one computer, effectively. Um, and often this distributed system software is very application specific. Um, for example, with a, um, a DHT. Um, the alternative, and this is what we often call a distributed operating system, is when, again, um, so we've got a distributed system. Instead of having completely autonomous operating systems running on each computer, these operating systems actually communicate and coordinate to give the impression of a single operating system to the higher level um, application software. So the application doesn't necessarily need to be aware that there's a distributed system running underneath. So this is, um, when I talk about distributed operating system, this is the scenario that I'm imagining. And just to be completely clear, I'm not talking about what people often call um, a network operating system. So um, here, as I said, each computer is running an operating system um, essentially privately and in, traditionally in a network operating system, a user will come along and um, you know, log in to the local computer and then have access to a load of remote resources like um, the file system and so on. And then in this scenario, the user is really responsible for taking advantage of the fact that um, there are multiple computers at their disposal. So they have to manually um, arrange for a program to execute, say, on a remote machine or to move their data from one place to another. OK, so the, uh, the title of my talk um, um, was given to me, actually. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> produce it. <laughs> but. So I did this slide partly for myself as much as, as any of you. So um, in terms of the, the hardware that underlies the operating system, um, we've got tightly coupled and we've got loosely coupled. So what do we mean by this? Well, tightly coupled is basically um, multiple CPUs that are connected uh, in um, 
physically very close proximity, so by a bus, or these days they might even be on the same chip. Um, those CPUs share a common address space. They all access the same physical memory. Um, and we see this, um, it's very common these days, um, multi-core or even mainframe. So I've actually got a picture there of a, a fairly recent architecture, which is um, an AMD Opteron called the Magni cores. And it, it's actually um, 48 cores in, um, there's um, four sockets and um, two chips on each socket, and then each chip has six cores. And then each of those sockets has some memory hanging off the side. So, you know, it, it's, it's a pretty complex machine, but it's still a tightly coupled architecture. Um, loosely coupled is what you've um, been hearing a lot about today and yesterday. Uh, basically, a distributed system is a loosely coupled architecture. Um, what we will see, though, as I, I get into the kind of account of historical systems is that there's actually um, a, um, a complete range of systems. Um, our systems today are very sort of uniform, but they didn't used to be, as you will see. Okay, so what's going on here? What am I really going to talk about? Um, so that distributed operating system that I described earlier, where the operating systems coordinate to give the impression that there's actually only one machine instead of multiple computers, are actually pretty rare. And um, I'm going to describe some research efforts, and by doing so, you'll probably understand why this is actually um, a very difficult problem. And in spite of 40, over 40 years of research efforts, people really haven't um, solved it, at least I don't think they've solved it adequately. Um, on the other hand, we have lots of operating systems for tightly coupled multiprocessor systems. Um, but it does turn out that even in those cases, especially with the advent of more uh, complicated, tightly coupled architectures, a lot of the design issues that um, you're learning about in these two weeks um, in the context of distributed systems, they also apply in the context of operating systems. And my claim is that it's kind of useful and it's certainly interesting to have a look at um, how people address these challenges in a slightly different context. And so that's what this talk is going to be about. So I, I've already alluded to this, um, the fact that um, current uh, tightly coupled architectures are getting um, pretty complex um, because of multiple cores, because of lots of parallelism, and because of the um, problems of um, scaling to multiple cores, which we'll get into later, um, we're getting quite complicated um, interconnects between those, between the cores, between the chips. The topologies can be quite complex, there can be uh, quite deep cache hierarchies, and all these things are basically making um, your computer look like a network. And so um, perhaps a logical um, inference from that is that if your computer looks like a network, maybe your, distrib your operating system should look like a distributed system. So maybe your operating system needs to worry more explicitly about all these problems that we've been hearing about, about replication, about consistency, um, and so on and so forth. And um, this um, sort of basic idea has recently, I'd say in the last um, three or four years, maybe a little longer, has um, motivated a number of research groups around the world to start looking at um, how operating systems, how the, the monolithic operating systems that we use, like um, Linux and Windows, aren't very well suited for these types of architectures. So maybe we should be uh, revisiting how we structure operating systems and starting to think about um, uh, how we might build them so that they're more suited, so they're more like a distributed system. Um, so in my next lecture tomorrow, I'm going to talk about one of these research operating systems that I was involved in up until about a year ago called Barrelfish. Okay, so the, the outline of today's talk. Um, so 
By way of introduction, I'm going to talk about how we classify parallel um, architectures. Um, not for any particular reason. Okay, so let me step back. In this talk, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff, but um, it's not about, uh, I don't expect you to, to remember all the, the, the information that I'm going to throw at you. Unlike other people, there's no sort of deep concepts here. What I'm trying to convey is a sense of um, the types of problems that people encounter in building operating systems for different types of computers and, and hopefully how, how uh, looking at how people address these problems, you will see that um, if you change some of your assumptions, say about your distributed system, about its scale, about its uh, communication speed, for example, um, that might break some of the things that you um, um, had chosen. If you were designing a system, you might choose you know, some particular protocol because you assume something about the underlying system. And then somebody takes your protocol and tries to run it on a completely different system, and it breaks. If you expect this, if you uh, uh, have a good feel for the assumptions that you're making in the design of this protocol, then you can um, firstly make your protocol more robust, more uh, flexible, and secondly, uh, you can maybe avoid running into um, bad stuff happening. So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to sort of give you an idea of, of what's going on there. Um, so I have, I have sort of picked somewhat arbitrarily um, four design issues um, relevant to operating systems that I want to focus on. And then I've got this selection of historical stuff um, starting in the early 1970s and going all the way through to about five years ago. So I, I'm not necessarily going to cover all of these. I'm going to see how we go with time, but, um, but that's the basic idea. Okay, so um, taxonomies of parallel hardware. There's a, a very famous one from um, a guy called Flynn in a, a 1966 paper, um, which is really simple um, and has actually been extended and refined uh, many, many times ever since then. But I think, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what it is, but Flynn's taxonomy is, is still referred to today in, in probably every computer science course. Um, so first of all, why, why did anyone really care? Um, well, way back when, um, people uh, built computers and they developed the software to run on those computers um, at the same time. It was generally the same people or closely related groups. Um, there wasn't a uh, kind of commodity hardware, so it, it was very specific. And so um, this diversity meant that people um, actually needed a way to talk about the machines they were building and to talk about the software they were developing. In the last maybe 20 years, may, maybe I'm sure people will argue with me on this point, but at some point, we've, we've basically settled on a standardized um, type of architecture for the machines that we use every day. Obviously, there's specialized supercomputers, and they're in a different class, but you know, your laptop, your, um, your desktop machine that you write your programs on, they're, they're all going to be basically the same. Your home machine that you're doing email, whatever, um, they all have a very, very sort of uniform um, architecture. And I think that the reason for this is that um, computers have kept getting faster, um, as predicted by Moore's law. And there have been a lot of very clever optimizations, um, for example, with compilers and other things. And this has meant that everything has just gotten faster. And, and also, hardware has gotten cheaper. And so uh, we've been able to stick with this design for architecture for the last 20 plus years, and everything has been um, pretty good. Um, Multicore has disrupted that to an extent. But um, when I show you the historical systems, I think you'll see that it could have been quite different. Uh, so what is Flynn's taxonomy? Well, um, basically, he um, categorizes parallel hardware into um, whether um, uh, it deals with 
a single data stream and a single instruction stream or multiple instruction streams or multiple data streams, etc., as you can see in the table. So let me go through these. Um, so first of all, um, single instruction stream, single data stream. So um, basically, each instruction is fetched and operated on one at a time. And this is um, the conventional uni processor. Uh, multiple instruction streams, multiple data streams. Um, well, we're basically looking at a conventional multiprocessor here. Um, so each processing unit is executing different instructions on different data. And in fact, um, um, in, in, the, in reality, this is normally programmed as you have one program, but you have, um, 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 you know, the data is parallelized. So it's, that's wrong. Let me, let me take that back. So it's normally programmed as one program, multiple data, but it's like uh, uh, you could put a uh, distributed system into this category. Okay, so it's exploiting thread level parallelism, by which I mean um, that um, we can have different um, um, execution units doing different things at the same time. Um, and typically, this can happen within one program, as, as you've already heard. Um, single instruction, multiple data stream. Um, so this is exploiting data level parallelism. So um, the idea here is that only one instruction is issued, but um, because of the parallelism of the algorithm, it can um, um, execute over many different um, data elements at the same time. So um, uh, a vector processor does exactly this. Um, people often say a GPU, um, it does kind of. Um, but, but the basic idea is that we've got, um, um, excuse me, the same, essentially the same um, execution happening um, over many different pieces of data all at the same time. Um, multiple instruction streams, single data stream. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I saw, I read a few things um, that talked about using this for redundancy. Um, I can't remember. I think it might have been um, in a... Um, aeronautical industry or somewhere like that. Um, but this is often, in, I also read a lot of other things that said uh, this, this uh, category in Flynn's taxonomy is its greatest weakness because there really aren't any computers built like this. So Flynn's taxonomy is fine, but it, it's um, uh, pretty one-dimensional. It doesn't really tell you enough, I don't think, about the different classes of machines that you can find. Um, so I dug around a bit, and there are a lot of uh, variations on the theme. And I chose this uh, particular one from a guy called Johnson in 1988, um, not because I think it's a particularly great extension to the taxonomy, but because it suited um, the, uh, the way in which I'm going to describe the systems I'm going to talk about today. So he observed that um, communication and synchronization and whether the memory is centralized or distributed actually have um, non-trivial effects on the performance and on how the uh, computer can be best programmed. So he, he extended the taxonomy by adding these uh, extra categories, whether the memory, whether there is a, a single global memory, whether it's distributed, um, whether variables are shared, by which he means shared memory, and whether it's um, a message passing or whether it's a message passing computer. Um, so I've actually renamed it slightly because I get really confused using his terminology. So by global, I'm, I'm talking about a centralized memory. Um, and this basically means that the memory modules um, can be accessed from any of the processors in the computer um, with equal um, rights, if you like, and with roughly equal um, delay. Distributed memory means that there's 
different access to the memory modules. Um, so um, depending, you know, on the process of where it is physically in the machine, whether it's got to go down multiple hops along the interconnect to reach that memory. Um, and then you, you can also make some of these memories private. Um, shared memory, um, you all know about this. Um, communication and synchronization take place implicitly by um, accessing variables in, the, in memory. And then message passing, there has to be this um, exchange of, of messages and the um, um, two endpoints don't share state directly. Okay, so uh, uh, just to dive in how these um, extended categories, um, uh, you know, what bearing they have on how we might be um, designing um, the operating system to go with such a machine. Um, Shared memory, centralized and shared memory, we've got basically a single physical address space. And so this implies that there has to be some synchronization mechanism on the data because it can be accessed by, um, uh, you know, many different processes. Um, it's uniform. Um, this kind of machine is, is also often called an SMP machine, symmetric multiprocessor or shared memory processor. Um, the concerns when you um, for the operating system designer, uh, the fact that there's a, a centralized memory means we may have contention on that memory, um, which can slow down uh, access times. Um, there may be contention on the um, interconnect used to reach that memory. Um, and basically, for these reasons, these machines have fairly limited scale. Um, I think the, the uh, kind of Typical thinking is that these uh, an SMP machine will scale to um, a few tens of cores at most. Um, some of the concerns about contention can be alleviated by having local caches, but now you've got the additional problem of uh, you need to define a cache coherency protocol. So you need some way um, to make sure that the data in those caches is consistent. Um, the next category, uh, distributed and shared memory. Um, so now we're looking at what we call a NUMA machine these days, so non-uniform memory access. Often there's multiple memory banks and they're attached to um, different um, chips in the system. Um, there's still a single address space, so there's still concerns about synchronization. Um, but there can be um, advantages to having memory nearby in terms of latency. Um, so this has the potential to scale to um, larger sizes, but it's actually it becomes more complicated to program because the programmer needs to understand that what what the the memory structure is and the fact that um, having data in one place means code will execute differently on one processor than another, and so on. Um, so this is interesting, um, centralized memory and message passing. So what does this mean? It means every processor has a private address space and they have to send a message to access data in memory. Um, the message can be non-blocking. I did actually have asynchronous here, but I changed it in honor of Robert. <laughs> so, um, uh, so this means that um, um, it can send a message and then continue to do useful work while it waits for a response. Um, again, these are uniform memory access, so every processor has equal access to the memory. Um, Johnson claimed that these machines were easier, easier to parallelize your program and easier to debug. Um, I don't know, you, you might want to think about this and decide. I mean, maybe sending messages is easier to debug than synchronization mechanisms if it goes wrong. I don't know. Um, so it's possible to use private caches in this, um, in this category of machine, um, but because they're private, there's no need for cache coherence protocols. On the other hand, you've got this penalty in um, the fact that you can't just share large amounts of data. It all has to be exchanged using messages. Um, 
there were actually a couple of computers built like this um, in the 80s. Um, I have their names somewhere, but um, they died a death. And we, we, as far as I know, there aren't any around now. Um, however, one thing you might want to think about is that um, this is somewhat re reminiscent to how network services are provided. So, um, you know, like uh, DNS or something. It, it's kind of a similar um, style, a similar arrangement. Actually, DNS is a bad example. Probably um, Windows Active Directory, the directory service for Windows is a better, better example. Um, okay, so the last one, distributed memory and message passing. So now we've got the private address spaces as before. Has to, every processor has to send a message to access memory. But the memory is distributed, so we've also got the complication um, of uh, um, that performance can vary depending on where code and data is placed. Um, these machines do exist, um, typically supercomputers. I've put some examples on the slide. Um, but the um, performance really depends a great deal on having a very um, um, fast interconnect. And so these... Um, um, Supercomputers generally are bespoke and um, very expensive. Um, you could also think of clusters of commodity hardware as being an example of this category. So um, in contrast to supercomputers, they are uh, cheap and easy to construct. Um, but using a cluster uh, in comparison to the tightly coupled multiprocessor, well, obviously we have a, um, a whole host of issues, um, again, we, we need to run an operating system per computer unless we're going into the, the regime of the distributed operating system. And then we have to worry particularly about the um, um, much, much higher latencies we're going to get uh, between nodes of the machine. OK, so that brings me to. Um, the uh, operating system design issues that I want to highlight in, in uh, uh, the, the second part of this talk. Um, so I guess having given you this uh, uh, kind of introduction to how we might categorize um, parallel architectures, these um, design issues now make a lot of sense. Um, so um, designing an operating system for the architecture, uh, it matters um, whether it's shared memory or message passing, uh, what do we do about caching and replication of state, how easy is it to exploit parallelism, and performance debugging. Um, there's a load of other stuff that I'm not going to talk about, which um, um, you know, I, could just, I could equally have chosen to put in this list, but um, I just happened to pick those four um, aspects of operating systems. Um, so as you've probably already um, figured out, um, shared memory versus message passing has implications for synchronization, for modularity. Um, um, it affects protection domains. Um, um, perhaps it's easier to trace and debug a message, de a message passing system. Um, we need to look at the performance costs of exchanging um, data, whether it's large amounts or whether there's um, um, overhead on exchanging small amounts of data. And we may have different styles. We may have uh, shared memory within a process between threads in the same process. We may have message passing between processes or some variation on that theme. Um, caching. So cache data can be private. Um, where there might be just one copy of the data, um, or it can be shared. So it may be um, cache data may be replicated in lots of caches throughout the machine. Um, caching obviously has some um, pretty um, um, substantial benefits, uh, particularly in terms of latency and in terms of contention on other resources in the system, like the memory bandwidth. Um, but the drawback, as I said before, is that these, uh, the data in the caches needs to be kept consistent with the cache coherence protocol. Um, so 
by exploiting parallelism, um, I'm really just going to try and, and um, highlight how well the operating system supports the programmer who's trying to make use of, the, of um, these multiple processes that they have at their disposal. And finally, um, what mechanisms are available for actually understanding the performance? Um, this is just a screenshot from uh, VTune, I think. But um, um, if you run Visual Studio today, which um, you may or may not have done, there's actually pretty sophisticated tools for um, profiling the concurrent behavior of your program and trying to figure out what's um, um, causing performance problems. Um, so I think this uh, kind of system, this, this kind of application is actually invaluable um, for debugging any kind of um, parallel environment, whether it's the operating system or whether it's your program. So that's why I've added this issue as something I, I want to look at with respect to um, other people's operating systems. Um, and finally, um, just to introduce this uh, sort of shorthand diagram um, style that I use throughout this talk. Um, basically, I've got colored boxes representing um, um, different parts of a, a system. So we've got the, a, green, a green rectangle representing memory, red for cache, yellow for CPU, and so on. So um, these are two examples. On the left is the, the centralized memory computer. So we've got a big memory on the top, and all the, the processes have equal access. The distributed memory, we've got four memory banks in this case, each one next to one of the processes. So you, you'll see a lot more examples of this throughout. And hopefully, it'll uh, um, give you um, quick clues as to the type of computer that I'm talking about, because I'm going to go through a, a range of them, and it might get confusing. OK, so that's actually a good point for me to pause. So for the, uh, the remainder of this talk, I'm going to present uh, a selection of um, historical multiprocessor and distributed operating systems. And I'm going to look in particular how they shape up with respect to the four design issues that I mentioned earlier. Um, there are perhaps some people in the audience who know rather more about some of these uh, older systems than I do. And uh, <laughs> Robert? <laughs> well. Um, anyway, anyone who knows, um, I, I uh, invite your input, um, and I welcome corrections, clarifications. And of course, any of you, please feel free to ask questions. Um, and as I said before, just to, to uh, reiterate, um, the purpose of what I'm going to show you is not to actually, you, you don't need to remember anything about these old systems. It, it's more a kind of thought exercise. Let's, let's just look at um, how they were built, how you know what what the design goals were, and how successful uh, they were at achieving those. Okay, so multiprocessor operating systems. Um, they were actually a research thing uh, many many years before they became mainstream. Um, but it turns out that uh, relatively few of the operating systems that we use from day to day were actually designed from the outset for multiprocessor hardware. So um, a as I've already said, by multiprocessor operating system, I mean something that runs on a tightly coupled architecture um, that has a single global namespace um, where the resource management is global across all the processes and uh, it looks you know, like a, a a single system image to the higher level software. So some examples, um, most of which are research. So um, Multics uh, is very famous, and that was started in 1965. Um, Hydra and Medusa and Taos and Mark are all ones that I may cover today if I have time. Um, and actually, I'm also going to talk about K42. Um, there's probably a load more. But none of these um, are the ones that we use day to day, like Windows and Linux. OK. Does, does 
but not the multiprocessor bit. Yeah. Okay, so starting um, back in the early 70s, um, this is a system um, called C.MMP and an operating system called Hydra. So it was built at uh, Carnegie Mellon and um, it consisted of a bunch of PDP-11s and could conceivably support up to 32 megabytes of memory. And the design goals for building this, this multiprocessor system were um, they wanted to figure out how, or, or sorry, the design goals of the software for this multiprocessor system were to figure out how to effectively use all of these processors um, and also to research um, various things about operating systems and runtimes for for this hardware. So what did it look like? Um, well, here's a diagram. Um, so basically, this was um, um, intended, it was actually, the hardware was actually built originally for AI, for speech and vision um, applications. Um, and it basically had a, a, a bunch of memory modules connected to a bunch of processors, which were PDP-11s, um, through this central switch. Um, so what this meant was that if you have M uh, memory modules and P processors, then at most um, there can only be um, the, the minimum of those two numbers um, simultaneous conversations um, going on uh, at any one time. Um, so it was actually the case that not every processor could access memory at the same time. Um, so this really doesn't scale. Um, it was also really expensive. Um, so in 1978, uh, I've been told that the C.MMP, there was only one, uh, it had 16 processors, um, it had three megabytes of shared memory, and the cost for the processors, the memory and the switch was roughly $600,000. Um, there was also uh, eight kilobytes of private memory on each of the processors, but that was mostly used by the operating system running on each processor um, for low-level stuff, per processor data structures, um, low-level synchronization. Okay, so um, this crossbar switch uh, had the great advantage that it meant there was uniform memory access, and it was also pretty fast. It was less than a microsecond if there was no contention, but they actually were really worried about contention. Um, there weren't any caches as we know them, apart from these private caches on each processor. Um, oh, and I, I already mentioned the cost of it. So Hydra is the operating system that was um, developed for this um, architecture. So it was designed from the outset to be distributed. So in particular, it was symmetric. So this meant that um, the operate there was no, um, um, you know, specialized um, operating system functionality that ran in one place. Um, it was basically the same operating system code running on every processor and they were all um, peers of each other. It was also um, object oriented. Uh, it had um, some uh, interesting uh, capability based access control and the big uh, sort of operating system idea that was um, published was um, this idea of separating the policy, like uh, say the policy uh, to do with which process gets scheduled next um, and the mechanism, how that was actually carried out. And I mean, th this kind of idea, separation of policy and mechanism, we, we take for granted these days in computer science, but it was, you know, it was novel enough at the time to warrant a paper, uh, I think in SOSP. And a PhD. Oh, okay, my boffer's PhD, apparently. Um, this, the, the debugging support, um, I think, goes back to, um, um, again, this, this um, state of affairs where the people who built the hardware were very close to the people who were developing the software. And so debugging, you know, it, it was really important and, um, um, you know, being able to debug things could feed back into modifications of of hardware and um, so on. So, so I think they took it a lot more seriously than perhaps we, we do these days. Um, and in fact, I've got a quote there from um, the Hydra book. 
the importance of these tools should not be underestimated. Um, design decisions are often based on intuitive assumptions of performance trade-offs, the implication being that you should really measure and observe um, um, in practice. Um, you, you need to look at the evidence to see if, if those assumptions are actually correct. So, Hydra, um, with respect to the design issues, well, okay, was it shared memory or message passing? It was definitely shared memory. There was a centralized memory and a single address space. Um, there wasn't any caching. So, um, exploiting parallelism, um, completely symmetric. Any process can run on any processor, so that's nice. They provided some low-level synchronization primitives, so that was, that was nice for the programmer. They had another really uh, innovative idea for the time, which was to lock the data structures that were being shared rather than the code. Okay? Again, this is something we take for granted, but um, it wasn't obvious. And this was, the, I, I guess, the kind of idea they were striving to, um, um, to have by um, building this kind of um, architecture that was quite quite radical in, in the day and then developing an operating system on top of it, you know, just to see what comes out and see what they needed to learn. And as I said, there, there was built-in support for performance debugging. So just um, a, a kind of a, a war story, the, the lack of caches. So um, in the book on Hydra, they kind of imply with this um, first um, quote here that actually they didn't really need caches. Um, they say caches present a potential difficulty because data shared between the processes may be modified in one process's cache without the modifications being reflected to other processes. We chose to solve this problem by avoiding it. They didn't say this was really a problem and we should have had caches. Um, and then somewhere else they observed that in fact the memory contention that they expected to have and that um, other experimental multiprocessors had experienced just wasn't a problem for them. So. I thought, well, <laughs> this can't be true. How, how, can, how can it not be advantageous to have caches? Well, it, it was just, um, um, well, there were a bunch of very good reasons. Um, firstly, the processes were really slow relative to the speed of main memory. So um, the collective processor speed of all the 16 PDP-11s was about 6 million instructions a second, whereas the memory bandwidth was um, about... Um, 500 million bits per second. So um, in the time it took to execute one instruction, quite, you know, a number of accesses could be made to main memory. Not only that, the memory at the time was magnetic core and it was expensive. Uh, and because it was expensive, caches were small. And so when you're talking about a price performance trade-off, which you often are, um, the, the gain per dollar really was not as significant as we would see today. Um, a real issue um, for this system was the fact that the PDP-11s were 16-bit and so the virtual address space was only 64 kilobytes versus the physical memory, the enormous physical memory of 3 megabytes. So what this meant was that the time to make individual memory accesses was in fact completely dwarfed by the time to reload the memory bank registers whenever a process um, wanted to access more than the 64 kilobytes of memory it had previously been accessing. Uh, so again, there wasn't a great deal to gain by caching. Um, and furthermore, they took advantage of a feature of the hardware um, to implement their low-level synchronization, which meant um, that um, they didn't need to spin on shared memory accesses. They, they basically moved the contention elsewhere. And so, um, again, this wasn't something that was going to be improved on by having caches. So that's a, a sort of, you know, a pretty interesting set of trade-offs. And I, I was quite struck by this when I found out about it because it's so different to the kind of trade-offs we make today. But the... Um, um, I believe that the perceived, um, um, the, the biggest drawback that was perceived about the C.MMP was the fact that it didn't scale. And so a few years later, another group at CMU, or, or possibly they overlapped, I'm not sure, um, 
decided to um, design a multiprocessor machine that scaled better than the C.MMP, and it was called C Star, um, and Medusa is the operating system I'm going to talk about. So um, this uh, was started in 1975, and uh, basically they got rid of the, the crossbar switch, the, the bottleneck with respect to memory access, and they replaced it with um, um, a completely distributed, they, they made the machine completely distributed, so there's basically this um, bus between all the different processes, um, and the goal, as I said, was to improve the scalability. So it's really gone to the other extreme. It now looks, um, you know, C.MMP maybe, if you squint it a bit, looks vaguely like the, the multi-core machines we use today. Um, CM star, it actually looks a lot more like a distributed system. So it consisted of uh, 50 processors, PDP-11s. Um, actually, they're not. They're um, LSI-11 processors. Um, again, three megabytes of shared memory. And it was actually uh, organized in a hierarchical scheme. So there were these uh, clusters of processors um, connected by a bus, and then um, um, each of the clusters was connected by another bus. And memory could be accessed um, either locally, so there was memory attached to each processor, so it could be accessed on the same processor within the cluster or at another cluster. Again, there were no caches. Um, there are actually two research operating systems developed um, for the CM Star, Star OS, and Medusa. And um, I've just selected um, to talk about Medusa. So um, a picture of the system. Um, CM stands for Compute Module. Um, they had these um, high-speed uh, microprogrammable communication controllers called KMAPs, um, and those are the things that enabled um, communications between CMs in the same cluster, and then they would all cooperate so that um, CMs could access memory in other clusters. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to say much more about that. Um, by the way, I should... Um, point out the, the little shorthand diagram there, um, in case you've forgotten, um, I think yellow is the, the, actually I've forgotten, that's not so good is it? Okay, so yellow is the CPU and uh, green is the memory. Okay, so CM star. Um, so uh, it was basically a NUMA machine. Um, it had some pretty extreme um, uh, latency uh, variations, though. Accessing memory on the same machine was around three microseconds, the same cluster, nine microseconds, and the remote cluster, 26. Um, and not only that, but when accessing remote memory, contention and latency became really big issues because there's basically still um, a shared interconnect there. Um, so in, it turns out that sharing is actually pretty expensive on the CM star and that um, concurrent processes run better if they're completely independent. Yes? Three megabytes, yeah, uh, collectively. Yes, yes. So it's still pretty small <laughs> by our standards. Yeah. Um, okay, so Medusa was this um, operating system developed in the late 70s. Um, and it had the explicit goal of making the operating system match the underlying hardware in the hope that this would lead to um, good performance. Um, however, this um, variation in the time it takes to access the different memories meant that a single copy of the operating system was completely impractical. You couldn't have one copy of the operating system running on one processor. Um, that, that would just not work at all. Um, it was also the case that they couldn't replicate the operating system um, across the, the um, machine because um, the memories on each processor were actually really small. They were only 64 or 128 kilobytes. 
and the typical um, operating system size of the day was uh, uh, you know, 40 to 60 kilobytes, so this was um, obviously unacceptable. So what did they do? Um, they basically replicated a minimal kernel on each processor, so that minimal kernel just dealt with um, um, you know, the, the basic stuff, the, the context switching and handling interrupts, and all the other OS functionality was divided into what they called utilities. And these utilities um, could run completely disjoint. A utility was basically pinned to a processor where it always executed. And um, utilities could be accessed by sending messages. Um, it kind of feels like a, um, a microkernel to me. I mean, it, it's what we would call a microkernel now, but that's not how they described it then. So the, uh, the utilities that they um, put in various places on various processes through the system were the memory manager, the file system, um, the task force. So uh, uh, task force was a word they used to describe collections of processes that um, executed, that cooperated to um, basically run a parallel program. Um, they had an exception reporter and, and they did have some uh, built-in debugging. So as you can imagine, this was quite complicated to program. Uh, one example that they uh, talk about is the potential for deadlock when doing a simple thing like opening a file. So here the file manager, which is um, uh, on one processor has to request some storage for a file control block from the memory manager in order to open the file. Um, however, if that file control block is um, swapped to disk um, because uh, there wasn't, it's, you know, it happens not to be in memory at the time, um, then the uh, memory manager has to talk back to the file system to uh, ask it to make a transfer from the file system and, and so we have deadlock. Um, uh, they actually did a, a form of um, gang scheduling of um, the processes in a task force in order to, to avoid um, live lock to make sure that things that needed to communicate were able to do so. Um, and another problem that I came across was that even the clock um, couldn't be believed because it was actually a peripheral attached to one of the compute modules um, and um, um, if a, a processor needed to know the time, it had to send a request to that, to the clock to, to say, tell me the time, where of course it was subject to, um, first of all, this, uh, these, these various um, access times to uh, access, um, um, if it happened to be in another cluster, for example, it would be hugely different access time to if it happened to be in the same cluster, uh, and, and it was subject to contention and possibly queuing. Um, so, so basically, they had to devise, uh, you know, higher-level software to deal with the fact that um, um, not every processor could rely on getting um, a consistent view of time. Um, so, with respect to the design issues, um, well, these uh, uh, utilities were um, message passing only. Um, and they did actually take quite a lot of care to make this as efficient as possible. Um, I don't have any details of that here, but um, that's certainly something they did. Um, they had this microkernel OS approach where they did replicate some of the operating system, but they had no caches. Um, and by having the utilities, they made sure that um, um, the execution of system calls, of operating system calls, was always close to the data um, that was pertinent to that system call. Um, exploiting parallelism, well, I mean, this, this whole thing was designed from the ground up, the ground up to be parallel. Um, they assigned uh, each of the, the processes or activities in a task force statically to a processor. Um, they had synchronization primitives for shared state, um, and they actually had some mechanisms to support these um, activities being added and removed. So th the number of parallel executions of something could be dynamically expanded and contracted. Um, and, and then the, um, 
they don't actually say any detail about what the performance measurements are that they keep, but they were obviously um, concerned enough to, to have a sort of um, persistent debugging tracing uh, mechanism so they could keep track of how things, how the operating system was doing. Um, so um, perhaps caching would have helped. Um, um, certainly they, another thing they observe is that um, um, it maybe wasn't ideal to go to this uh, completely minimal kernel replicated on every processor and perhaps it would have been better to um, have local caches and be able to keep uh, more of the heavily used operating system state where in you know in the places where it was accessed. Um, so here they weren't entirely happy with their lack of caches. They they did uh, observe it to be a problem. Okay, so that's that's the kind of ancient history. Does anyone have any questions or comments even? Okay, so now um, um, we're moving into the 1980s, getting a bit more modern. Um, so, no, so now um, there's a, a lot more uh, availability of commodity components and the price of things has come down. Um, so the Firefly, um, Chandu, have you actually used the Firefly? Yeah. So you, you did all your early research on this. So you can um, speak up if you need to. Okay. So um, um, the, Fire, the Firefly was uh, developed at um, DexCIRC um, in the late 1980s and it was a shared memory multiprocessor and it was intended to be a personal workstation. So all the researchers in this lab had one of these machines on their desk and they did their research on this computer, uh, which they also built and which they also wrote the operating system for and all the software. Um, so they had these requirements when they were building this machine. They, um, they wanted it to be a multiprocessor. They felt that this was important for their research. I don't know why. Perhaps because they felt multiprocessors were the future? Or so the, the rationale that Chuck had was that if you get commodity processors, it takes two years for them to talk about which one wants to buy. So you can take, once you build a multiprocessor, uh, you can just put in a new processor every time it comes and you get four four eight two. And and so you know you build it once and it takes two years to get Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, they uh, also had a goal of um, building it quickly and um, also that it should be um, relatively easy to program. Um, so here's a, a picture of the, uh, the version 2. So um, um, it's a, a Yuma machine, the Uniform Memory Access. Um, uh, basically, they had five processors. Um, at least this version did, um, and a, a shared bus connecting them. It's starting to look a lot more conventional, at least to us. Um, so this was one of the first multiprocessors that actually implemented um, hardware-supported cache coherence. So um, they had caches, and they had a coherence protocol, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, they were worried about bus contention. They were worried about bus contention, I believe, before the um, um, physical machine actually existed. And so they did some analysis using a trace-driven simulation and decided that um, things would um, keep on getting better up to about nine processes. And beyond that, they would um, um, be hurt too much by contention on the bus. And I believe that the, the reality um, bore out this um, this early analysis. Um, so the operating system built for um, uh, the Firefly was called Taos, and um, it was uh, also a, a microkernel, so there was um, a very minimal set of uh, operating system functionality in the kernel. Um, and the rest of the OS ran um, in user mode as these distinguished processes, so the file system, the networking, and so on. Um, were, were up in user space. Um, 
so they again this seems very familiar and and uh, uh, very obvious to us they supported um, um, threads um, in a shared address space um, they actually did this uh, using a library module um, called um, threads there's some confusion about whether the operating system is called Topaz or Taos, but I think that Topaz is more of the all of the system software, whereas Taos is the uh, actual operating system. Um, so everything, including the operating system, was multi-threaded and executed simultaneously on multiple processes. Um, they had this uh, uniform uh, remote procedure call mechanism, and in fact this is um, in common with some other systems. Um, so by this I mean they used RPC um, on the same machine, for example, to access those um, user space operating system functions uh, and also across the network between machines. Um, so, um, well, I'll say more about that in a minute. So the design issues. Um, well, we had shared memory, multiple threads in a um, single address space, and then there was also this message passing um, in common with some other systems. Um, as I said before, it had uh, hardware cache coherence, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, had pretty good support for programmers to write um, shared memory synchronized programs. Um, performance debugging. So. Uh, I, I did ask some of the people involved um, what the situation was with performance debugging, and they said, well, it was very binary. Did it work or didn't it? And that was <laughs> kind of what, what, what they cared about. So that, that I mean, they, they cared about good performance, but it wasn't really um, such a, a big issue to them. They were more concerned about um, how, how, how to use the machine, I suppose, how to design the machine so it was usable. So um, just an aside, um, I wanted to review uh, quickly um, at, a, at a very sort of high level um, cache coherence protocols. Um, so there's a definition of uh, when a memory system is coherent. Um, so basically if a processor uh, P um, reads a location called X, then it should return the value previously written by itself, um, assuming that no other processor has written to X in between. Um, so essentially, this preserves program order. This is what you would expect to see on a uni processor, and indeed, you, you rely on this being the case in a, a multiprocessor too. Um, also, a read of location X by um, a different processor will return the value that was previously written by the first processor, provided there's sufficient time in between and no other writes in between. So we're not saying that um, um, when a, a, a location is updated in memory that all the processors somehow instantly see that, um, that new value. I mean, that, that's not realistic. What we're saying is that there's a, a provided that the, the period of time between the, the value being written and the other processes being able to read the newly written value is small enough, then that's okay. Um, and it, we also require that writes to the same location um, are the same on all processes, as you would expect. You can imagine that if that wasn't the case, um, some uh, very bad things could, could happen. Um, you know, updates could get lost. So this, uh, a sufficient time later, what, what is this? Um, well, this is talking about memory consistency, which is um, basically defining uh, when a written value is uh, seen by the reader who, who comes to look at it later. Um, so um, the most um, sort of basic definition of memory consistency is, is known as sequential consistency um, and what this sequential consistency is saying that um, the writes by one processor are not reordered um, 
rights are serviced in the order that they're received, so there could be some arbitrary interleaving of rights from different processes, um, but um, you know, within the, the, the sequence of rights by one processor will always, be, um, um, will always appear in the right order. Um, so this is very simple, um, but it does reduce potential performance. Um, and the reason for this is because there's a lot of um, optimizations that, um, uh, for example, compiler optimizations like um, you know, um, loop transformations and register allocations and also hardware optimizations like pipelining um, and so on. And these um, basically lead to overlapping and reordering of, of memory operations um, and so violating sequential consistency. Um, so what to do? Well, um, fortunately, um, um, it's possible to uh, introduce a more relaxed consistency model if um, um, there's an assumption that the program is going to be synchronized. So um, um, this weaker consistency model is hidden from the programmer, but um, in fact the underlying hardware is not um, um, necessarily giving full s sequential consistency. So. There's actually a huge literature on this, if anybody's interested. Um, I'm not an expert in it, but I recommend um, th th I can give you some pointers to uh, some interesting stuff you can read. Um, OK, so there's uh, two styles of cache coherence. Um, um, so the first one is called write through, and this is when um, uh, when data is written, when a, a cache line is written, um, it gets updated in the cache and immediately uh, pushed through to main memory as well. And um, this simplifies the coherency protocol, especially on a multiprocessor, because now um, the copy in main memory is always the most up-to-date, is always the, the current version of that data. Uh, but it has a, a significant drawback, which is um, vastly increased um, traffic between um, the processor and main memory. Uh, the second style, which gets rid of that, um, that problem, is called, well, at least um, alleviates that problem to an extent, is called write back. And here, um, when a memory location is written, the, um, um, the update only appears in the cache and um, it's uh, um, um, flushed to main memory only when the um, cache line is, only when the block is replaced in the cache. Um, so this, is, this has a number of um, benefits. One of them is low latency, so a write doesn't have to be um, written all the way through to main memory. It can just happen locally in the cache, uh, which is fast. Um, if um, nobody else is interested in that data block, then multiple writes can basically occur in the same, um, in the same block, and um, these can all be um, effectively batched together um, and only require one write to memory. Um, however, again, this is a little tricky for multiprocessors because um, now the, the copy in main memory is not necessarily the most current, and so the cache coherence protocol has to deal with that. Yeah? By monitoring the bus traffic. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, okay, so very, um, very briefly, I don't, I don't want to go into this in great depth. I just wanted to, to give you a flavor of what a, a cache coherence, hardware cache coherence looks like. Um, this is a very um, uh, common one. Um, basically, every cache line is going to be in one of five states. Um, so modified means that um, the, 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 um, the cache that holds the line has the most recent the, um, correct copy of the data and the copy in main, mem in main memory is um, stale and incorrect and there's no other processor holds a copy of this cache line. 
Um, so now the, uh, um, the cache line is in the modified state. The processor can um, you know, update that data at will um, as they like. Um, so from modified, the cache line can be changed to exclusive, meaning that it's, um, it's clean. There's also um, the, the copy in main memory is also current um, simply by um, uh, uh, writing the line back to main memory. Okay. Um, the owned, um, so here the, um, uh, again, only, there's only one, um, um, only one processor can have that cache line in the owned state, but there may be other copies of the cache line. And owned, um, it can be dirty, um, meaning that um, it's, um, the copy that's in main memory is out of date. Um, the advantage of the owned, uh, uh, the fact that this state exists because it means that uh, if some other um, uh, processor wants to get a copy of that data, um, it can actually get it directly from the cache that holds it in the owned state. So um, that has some performance advantages potentially. Um, and then there's the, the shared state where um, um, the data is present in, in the current, you know, in the, this cache, but possibly also in other caches, and none of those uh, lines can be updated. Um, so a read of a cache line can be satisfied from any of these states apart from invalid. Um, when a line is fetched into the cache, it goes into either shared or exclusive, depending on whether um, there's an intention to, to write the line. Um, and as I said, when, when the line is in the own state, um, it can be transferred between caches without involving main memory. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to say about cache coherence um, is about Snoopy protocols. So um, there's also directory protocols, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, in a Snoopy protocol, every cache controller basically watches the, the um, cache traffic on the bus. Um, and so um, every cache controller will see when there's a request to um, um, acquire a line for in the, you know in the exclusive state or in the shared state, and it can um, service a request or, or do what it needs to do, you know, possibly invalidate a line in its local cache, and so on. Um, if there's ties, there there has to be some kind of arbitration scheme. Um, uh, some way to, to say that one request happened before another. And there's lots of optimizations. And again, there's a lot of literature on this um, to, to um, improve latencies, to reduce bus traffic, um, and um, basically make everything um, use fewer resources and go faster. It's a, a pretty extensive area, as you can imagine. So having uh, uh, done that um, whirlwind tour of uh, cache coherency, back to the, the Firefly. So the, the, this cache coherence protocol, that, uh, as I said, was uh, uh, one of the first ones that was actually implemented in a real system, was um, um, a Snoopy protocol. And it used a scheme called, um, well, you, you could think of it as conditional right through. So um, unlike the, the MOSI protocol that I described earlier, which is a sort of common um, modern day cache coherence protocol, um, here they, they allowed lines to be writable in multiple caches at once. So when, when uh, um, uh, a block is updated, if the line is not shared, it uses write back. So it just keeps that, um, that block in the cache and uh, only writes it to main memory when it's evicted. Um, however, when there's um, um, because the, uh, uh, the cache line might be present in multiple caches and they all might be writing to it every time um, something is written and it's, um, it's shared, uh, basically there has to be a write through to main memory. And not only that, the cache has to acquire the bus before it can modify the line. So um, there's definitely a, a performance trade-off there. Um, so what were some of these um, trade-offs? Well, um, basically, um, this write-through continued 
while the uh, cash line is in, if the cash line is in multiple caches, um, even if only one of those caches is actually, if the data is only being modified um, in one of those caches, um, um, this write-through behavior will continue. And so it's basically, they're getting the performance penalty um, unnecessarily. And um, in fact, this quite easily leads to false sharing um, <coughs> Um, where um, there's um, a line, um, a line is bouncing back, is being modified in different caches simply because two um, 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 pieces of data are adjacent and end up on the same cache line, even though they're not actually being shared. They're actually being modified independently, if you like. Um, apparently, false sharing was um, very common because um, memory was very expensive and so compilers actually packed things in very densely and so um, you typically got a lot of stuff sharing um, a cache line that um, wasn't perhaps necessary. <coughs> Another drawback with the cache coherence scheme they had was that process migration from one processor to another was really expensive because now the data is held in two caches for a while and it's almost certainly only being updated in one of those caches, but because it's shared um, and being written, there's, there's this uh, performance cost. So um, later, you know, more recent Snoopy protocols actually, um, a, as I showed before, in, introduced this um, um, owned state and, and so um, alleviated some of these problems. Okay, so uh, another interesting thing about the, the Firefly, um, they talk about, um, um, in their, the paper on the Firefly, they talk about how they thought they had a balanced system. And uh, I thought this was very curious. You know, what do they mean by, by balance? Um, so it's, it turns out it's, it's to do with their goals and how much they cost them. Um, so they actually intended the, the cash simply to reduce the load uh, on the memory system rather than reduce the, um, the access time from the processor. So they weren't so much interested in um, the, the cost of going to main memory for the program. They were more interested in making the system um, function and, and scale to the number of processors that they wanted. Um, so... Um, um, they had a, a relatively low performance bus um, and they wanted it to be able to support um, several processes. But in fact, there were, there were two things that limited the number that it could support. Um, um, the bus itself, the, some electrical constraints and the memory bandwidth. And so they ended up with this, um, as, as I said before, they, they found by simulation that up to nine processes was feasible. Um, and in fact, I think five was a pretty standard number. And this meant, although they actually had quite low hit rates, the cost of going to memory wasn't that expensive. Um, um, also because the, of the speed of the processors relative to main memory. So if these processors were a whole lot faster compared to main memory, then they uh, realize that they would have to do something about that by making the caches bigger um, or, or making the, the size of the, the data blocks that were cached larger. Um, another point is this um, um, design feature of remote procedure call, um, which was used extensively. Um, so RPC has some uh, overheads um, to do with, um, um, you know, marshalling and unmarshalling um, of arguments, for example. Um, so it seems kind of curious that, that you would want to do this same machine. But in fact, um, um, the designers of the Firefly and the, the Tawos deliberately um, um, traded performance for these two factors for simplicity the fact it was really easy for the programmer to have this um, sort of uniform way of accessing things on the same machine and on remote machines, and the, the correctness, the fact that they, the, um, 
address spaces were isolated. They didn't need to worry about user processes um, uh, trampling all over the um, memory of an operating system um, process, for example. Um, so they actually um, tuned it to be fast enough and then didn't worry about it. Okay, so um, how long have I have I got? What's the the timing? Fifteen minutes. Okay, so um, I think I'll skip. Um, I'm going to skip through Mark and I'm going to go to Amoeba because Amoeba is the only one in this list that really tried to be a true distributed operating system. And it also has the advantage that Robert worked on it as a PhD student. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. 45 minutes. Oh, okay. In that case, I'll do Mark. <laughs> Okay, another CMU um, um, invention was this uh, uh, operating system called MARC. Um, so they're actually trying to find the middle ground between a distributed operating system and a multiprocessor operating system. Um, they wanted to span all of them and run everywhere seamlessly. Uh, they also uh, were worried about things like Unix compatibility and performance comparable to Unix. Um, so, the main uh, sort of key idea here is that um, message passing and virtual memory are actually duals. So, uh, you can use each one to implement the other, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. Um, so, Mark was actually um, uh, quite a long running project. Um, it was ported to a bunch of different um, hardware platforms. So uh, unlike the previous operating systems that I've talked about, which were designed specifically for uh, one platform, here we're moving into a, a proper general purpose operating system. Um, it was used uh, actually as the basis of OSF1. Um, and um, as you said earlier, it was pieces of it are in Mac OS. My boss's boss. Oh, Rick. <laughs> yes. Rick Rashi did this uh, when he was at CMU, among many other famous computer scientists, actually. Um, OK, so Mark was a proper uh, microkernel. Um, lots of operating system functionality implemented as user level um, servers. Um, again, they, they, had, uh, they had the idea of threads, which wasn't that common back then. Um, and similar to Taos, um, they used RPC for communication. Um, so RPC is expensive compared to shared memory on a tightly coupled platform. Um, that's one drawback with it. And the other is um, that um, there are actually multiple layers to get through. There's you know, the marshalling and the unmarshalling, for example. Um, and sometimes some hardware boundaries, and these overheads apply irrespective of the size of the data transfer. And this this becomes important when we when we look at how uh, Mark was doing this um, uh, virtual memory um, message passing thing. Um, so I believe they did um, uh, actually implement a few um, common operations, um, I.O. operations like Unix read. They did actually um, have a, an optimized shared memory implementation. So it wasn't all you know, pure RPC everywhere, but, but that was the basic idea. Well, mm -hmm. OK. Okay. So they had an asynchronous message passing layer. Yeah, Okay. Okay. So um, uh, these um, I wrote IPC inter um, 
um, what's the IPC stand for? Thank you. You're less jet lagged than I am. Um, okay, so so they had ports, which were basically communication channels or um, message queues. Um, a port could have many senders and one receiver, um, and this was all protected. So you needed a capability in order to um, send, um, in in order to um, access a port. Um, so all objects in Mark are, are basically represented by ports. And then there are messages, which are um, um, a header plus a body. Um, a single message can actually transfer quite a lot of data up to the, the uh, entire address space um, of a task. And messages um, are sent and received on ports. Um, so, and they, they can be blocking or non-blocking. Okay. So this um, um, communication virtual memory duality. Um, so this has been observed by um, many people, in fact. Um, um, I've never heard of any other system that actually tried to make it real in the way that Mark did. Um, so an efficient way of implementing message passing um, is to use um, um, memory management. So the message contents are mapped to memory and then um, they use copy on write which means that um, um, both the sender and receiver um, um, are able to access the single copy um, of the contents of the message until uh, one of them um, makes a, a modification and then the, the memory is physically copied then. And this is, um, this is really efficient and this is how um, you can um, pass a message that consists of the entire address space of a process. Um, alternatively, um, memory management can be implemented by sending messages um, simply because it's a microkernel and all of these um, operating system services are, are just user level processes that are sitting there listening um, on a port. Um, and so, um, um, uh, basically, the um, um, some you know pager process will be managing the paging of um, memory to some backing store, and since the kernel communicates, you know, basically by sending messages to this um, user level pager, it actually doesn't matter whether it's local or remote. Um, so this is very flexible, and th and in this way, they they are able to get exactly the same interface whether the machine is loosely or tightly coupled. So with respect to the design issues, well, it's it's both shared memory and it's message passing, um, and it has this very um, w which leads to this very modular modular structure um, with all sorts of advantages. Um, but I, I would say that um, um, depending on how they organize um, the services um, in user space and you know where messages have to be sent in order to get something done, they're paying the cost of sending those messages every single time. So um, there's definitely a trade-off. And um, um, I believe that in later versions of Mark, as they moved more and more to a kind of pure microkernel um, organization, um, they actually ran into some pretty substantial performance issues. Um, so uh, here's one example um, that I found in um, the, the Kaluris uh, Distributed Systems book. There's a chapter on Mark at the back, um, which uh, you may be interested to, to read at some point. Um, so the performance of, of copy on write varies depending on how many, um, how many bytes are involved, basically, because of this fixed overhead that um, um, uh, there's a, you know there's a, a a bunch of setup that has to be done before copy on write becomes feasible. So the milliseconds to copy messages of different sizes. I just copied this straight from the book. If the message is eight kilobytes, a simple copy, the kind of copy you might do if you were um, just implementing a conventional message passing, is 1.4 milliseconds. Then the setup for the copy on write 
one and a half, and the actual copy on write, the time to do that will be um, 4.8. So, okay, the simple copy um, actually uh, to send the message will be two copies. There'll be a, a um, you know, from the sender to the kernel and then from the kernel to the receiver. So you can double that, but still copy on write is basically going to be twice as expensive. Um, and then if the message is uh, much larger, is 256 kilobytes, then now you're, you're starting to see um, perhaps a gain by copy on write because a simple copy 44.8, if you double that, then uh, it's actually going to be more expensive than uh, doing the, the copy on write version. Um, so even if, um, uh, let me just uh, cancel that, move on. So there's an example. Caching and replication. Um, uh, so Mark was intended uh, right from the beginning to run on a variety of hardware. So it, it does take advantage, uh, as any operating system does, of any hardware-provided cache coherence. Um, but it is also um, pretty trivial to explicitly um, to, to uh, manage a cache explicitly in the operating system. Um, I don't have uh, uh, too much to say about that. I couldn't glean any more from, from the papers. Um, they had uh, uh, actually a number of mechanisms for achieving parallelism. So um, uh, in, in a way that's familiar to all of us, they could have many threads in a shared address space and, and they had some synchronization primitives that use shared memory. Um, they could also um, have multiple tasks. This is like having multiple processes that were able to um, designate regions of address space as shared. And then they also had um, the messages. So I, I don't know if, if you were programming this thing how you would decide what to use, but um, there, there were certainly a number of options and they could be tuned to run very well on the, the particular architecture that they happen to have at hand. Um, so again, Mark had a, a, a fairly primitive kernel debugger built in um, one thing that occurred to me that um, I think would be challenging for performance debugging in Mark is the fact that um, um, messages are, are forwarded to remote nodes without any way of the, um, the programmer or the user knowing uh, whether you know, the, the service that they're sending a message to is going to be on the same machine or is going to be on a remote machine. Also, copy on write semantics actually... Um, um, it, it's potentially complicating because it's like a, a sort of a lazy copy. And so um, you don't necessarily know when that uh, uh, all that data is being, um, is being copied. And so there might be a, you know, uh, some, um, um, something might happen, you know, the, the copy might happen at some future time caused by some other event that you had um, long since lost track of. And I, this is, in, in general, hard for people trying to figure out why their system is not running as fast as they expect. Okay. So, um, I hope you're all not uh, too exhausted by this uh, run through all of these historical systems. Um, I'm now going to move to the, the distributed operating system in the bunch, Amoeba. Um, so this is, um, this was started in the early 80s um, and they had, um, um, I mean basically it was intended to be a research platform um, and so they wanted a system that would be distributed, that used lots of uh, CPUs, and they wanted it to look like a single system image. So, it, you know, the, the idea that there were multiple machines should be hidden from the higher level software. And they uh, also stated a design goal of performance, but, but of course. Um, just as an aside, um, this notion of transparency. Um, so here's the definition that Robert wrote, apparently. You remember this? What was that? With, my With your advisor, yes. 
um, a distributed operating system looks like an ordinary centralized operating system but runs on multiple independent central processing units. So this, uh, this business of looking like an ordinary centralized operating system, um, this is transparency. So there's actually a number of uh, uh, ways um, you, you can um, consider transparency. So there's uh, a transparency of location. Um, do we need to, to see where something, where a process is running? Does it matter where the data actually lives and so on? Um, transparent replication is another um, common use of it. So um, files get replicated so, um, and, and usually that's dealt with at a lower level so the user doesn't need to be aware of it. If, some, if there's a failure, um, um, they don't need to worry about finding the replica. Um, um, transparent concurrency, so um, in the context of Amoeba, I think this is just uh, about not knowing that there are other users in the system. Um, transparent parallelism, um, again, this is a more of a goal than in actuality, um, being able to automatically parallelize serial programs and um, um, not have to worry about the fact that they're executing, not, not have to um, contrive to make them execute in parallel. Um, so um, this is a, a, a um, kind of overview of, of how I think um, transparency can be regarded. I mean, these are uh, uh, all um, challenging goals in one way or another. So back to Amoeba. Um, so what did it look like? Um, it was uh, basically a bunch of computers, 80 computers, um, and they each had private memory. Um, um, and that was the processor pool. And then there were also a number of workstations where users um, interacted with the system and also um, some specialized servers. So it was a pretty uh, heterogeneous system. Um, and between them is Ethernet. So the operating system, uh, it's another microkernel. Um, and again, most uh, operating system services are running in user level. Um, it was interesting in that it was um, completely object oriented and every object was managed by a server process. Robert, do feel free to jump in if, uh, <laughs> if anything's disturbing you. <laughs> um, um, so, um, um, uh, where was it? Right, um, yes, and it also um, used capabilities, which I'm not going to say anything else about, but um, I think that was quite an interesting aspect of it. Um, how did Amoeba do communication and sharing? Um, so the um, um, inter-process communication was uh, blocking RPC, although on um, a single machine in a single process, the threads um, used synchronization through shared memory. Um, there was a facility for group communication um, and this was used to update shared data by cooperating servers um, and this was all in user space so this was built on top of the operating system. Mm -hmm. um, and there, yes, no, you, you did, okay. Is that what was commonly used, the in-kernel version? Okay. Okay. And and there there was also some software um, providing a, a sort of uh, distributed shared memory, and this really was at user level. Yes. Okay. Um, so the location transparency in Amoeba. Um, so users uh, didn't know um, where servers exist where, you know, on which machine they lived, and they also didn't know um, where their program was actually being run. So there was a server that uh, basically um, decided for them. Um, in the RPC stubs, um, there was a built-in broadcast mechanism to find the right server. So you remember I said that every object was owned by a particular server. Um, so 
so the way that um, um, the location of that was figured out was, was by uh, basically doing a broadcast. The results are cached, so once um, um, it's known where the location is, this is cached locally and subsequent RPCs to that server are very fast. Um, but one of the papers I read said that it can actually take uh, up to 30 seconds to, um, to uh, get this um, information into the cache. Um, so it's transparent, but it's really only transparent if, it's, if the cache is hot um, and if the, the servers that you're looking for are up and running. Uh, okay, so looking at the design issues, as I've said, there's um, um, pervasive RPC. And I had to put this quote in. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Andy Tannenbaum would have written this. I recognize the style. But uh, uh, he says, although it has long since been corrected, uh, we made a truly dreadful decision to have asynchronous RPC. Uh, in that system, the sender transmitted a message to the receiver and then continued executing. When the reply came in, the, the sender was interrupted. This scheme allowed considerable parallelism but was impossible to program correctly. Our advice to future designers is to avoid asynchronous messages like the plague. Um, and from what Chandu um, mentioned earlier, it sounds like uh, Amoeba is not the only system where the designers decided that uh, um, uh, non-blocking um, Message passing was a great idea in theory, but in practice, uh, they they didn't want to actually use it. Okay. <laughs> but Taos had blocking oh, yeah. RPCs, yes. Okay, um, so from, from my, my um, uh, perception from reading the papers is that um, in Amoeba there was a, a potentially a bottleneck with critical OS servers um, and, and so they could be duplicated um, and um, kept consistent transparently. Was that done? Okay. 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 Um, and then parallelism. Um, a, a process couldn't be split over multiple machines, so it was a slightly. It was um, uh, the the granularity of parallelism was between processes. As for de performance debugging, I have no idea. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, just to return to the, the transparency issue briefly, um, um, I, I think it's an interesting question whether transparency is actually um, always desirable. Um, obviously, it's very flexible and it's, it's portable, hiding a lot of uh, um, uh, details of, of what architecture it's running on and so on, and, and also a lot of complexity. But there seems to be um, um, unpredictable performance is, uh, is always a challenge with transparency. Um, and so this uh, is a challenge that I think um, um, keeps returning. It is, you know, how do you provide transparency, whatever type of transparency you want, while at the same time being able to take advantage of um, the mechanisms that the hardware provides or that the, the you know, other software provides to get uh, good performance. Um, okay, so I think I think I'm going to skip VAX clusters and move on to K42. Um, VAX clusters is in this list because um, it's actually uh, it's not trying to be a, distribu a, a proper distributed operating system. It's and it's also not a multiprocessor operating system, but it's basically a set of operating system services that run on a cluster. In it. I think they, they call it a, um, a, what do they call it? Closely coupled is what they called it. Um, and VAX clusters is also uh, 
a real system that for many, many years you could go out and buy and use, and a lot of people did. And so that's why it's in this list. But it, it's really uh, you know, a, a different beast to any of the other things I've been talking about. But um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that and go to K42. Um, this is the last thing I want to talk about, and this is um, a multiprocessor operating system again. Um, so this was a, a research project um, that went on at IBM Research for almost 10 years. Um, and they, would, they imagined in 1996 or thereabouts, they, they sort of uh, had a stab at uh, uh, trying to predict um, what was going to happen in, um, in terms of architectures. And they figured that large-scale cache-coherent NUMA was what was coming. And, and, by, and by large scale, you know, they were thinking many tens of, of cores. Um, in fact, this didn't come to pass, but this was uh, uh, what they were um, designing the operating system to work on. So they were, um, um, OK, they actually wanted to scale to hundreds of processes. Um, so they had goals of, of uh, good locality. Uh, they, they were actually uh, very um, dedicated to trying to build an operating system with good performance. Um, they cared about scalability, reliability, um, and, and also that the operating system had to be portable, it had to be customizable, and in fact um, they explicitly stated they wanted to be able to exploit architecture specific features to get good performance. Uh, just a reminder of um, um, what a cache coherent Numa machine is. Um, um, basically, talking about a machine with um, distributed memory um, has a hardware cache coherence protocol. Um, typically, these days, a very deep cache hierarchy, so there will be multiple levels of cache and um, sharing uh, of caches um, in different places. Um, and shared memory is relatively expensive to access in these machines. So K42 was a, um, another completely object-oriented um, operating system. Uh, so every resource in the system is managed by a set of object instances. And they went to great lengths to avoid having any global uh, data structures or locks. So uh, an operating system like Windows will inevitably have you know, a fair number of global data structures. And in fact, in Windows, um, I'll um, give you more uh, information about this in my talk tomorrow. In Windows, in Windows, they've been going to great lengths to try and get rid of these global data structures because they're, they're a, a serious uh, bottleneck. Um, so K42 is a you know, Linux-compatible microkernel. Um, and in the microkernel, it, uh, it does memory management, process management, um, IPC scheduling, and so on. And it's an open source project. And so if, uh, uh, if you care to, I think you can still go and download the source code. Um, so why use uh, uh, object orientation in an operating system? Um, well. Basically, it's um, to avoid um, um, the um, um, you know, interaction of potentially unrelated user-level requests um, down in the operating system. So by decomposing um, everything out into these little objects, then the idea is that these requests can be routed completely independently, serviced independently, and there'll be better performance. Um, so the key uh, uh, kind of idea around this in um, K42 is something called uh, clustered objects. Um, so as I said before, the objects um, represent resources. Um, but in this case, they also include the locks. So a clustered object includes the locks that are required to manipulate that resource. And by doing this, they're basically getting um, really good locality. So everything that you need um, to um, manipulate some resource is going to be in the same place and hopefully in the same cache. Um, 
there are, um, so in any multiprocessor operating system, there's going to be some, some data structures that have to be shared across multiple processes. Um, but the idea is that these um, clustered objects will allow the OS to um, um, almost eliminate the sharing on those objects. And this works because um, within the clustered object, the, ob you know, the, the object instances can be replicated um, or partitioned across the, um, uh, the multiprocessor depending upon how um, the object is going to be used. Um, so this is transparent to the processors. They, um, all, they, all they know about is some reference to that object that is consistent, but then um, the actual invocation will be routed to the closest uh, object instance. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so this, this, uh, uh, the sharing and the locking strategy can be specific to how the object is being used. Um, so um, these kind of optimizations do exist on other operating systems, but they're, they're typically done in an ad hoc way to solve a particular problem, you know, a particular bottleneck, whereas here it's actually built into the operating system. Um, and an example of a clustered object is, uh, say, a process. A, pro you know, a process in the system um, will be um, uh, potentially replicated to every processor, so every processor has the, the information about that and can um, schedule it or whatever. Um, here's a, a kind of uh, trivial example of um, a clustered object for a shared counter. So um, here, um, um, it's basically the clustered object consists of, the, the object itself has three methods, um, inc, increment, uh, dec, decrement, and val, get the value. Um, and perhaps it might be uh, implemented as three uh, individual object instances, each of which is accessed by a different processor in the system. So if it turns out that increment and decrement are the operations that are most commonly done on this counter, um, then in fact, um, um, by keeping these um, uh, object instances local to each processor, uh, those become really efficient. There's no need for any communication uh, between the other instances um, if it's just being um, incremented or decremented. The only time that um, all the object instances need to figure out the, the a kind of global state is, is when one of the processors invokes val, give me the, the current value. So, so then the object has to go and say, you know, what's your value, what's your value, and, and agree on um, what answer they're going to give. On the other hand, if val is a common operation, then in fact having um, a, a shared implementation, so, so not distributing these object instances, uh, might actually be more efficient. It might be better to keep all that information in just one place and have every processor access one copy. Yeah. Um, so you're asking, yeah. Well, um, so there's, there's, in this example, there might be individual instances of this um, shared counter which happen to be replicated on the different processes, okay? But uh, logically, there's only one of them. There's only one of them in the system. And um, depending on how that counter is going to be used, the operating system might implement it as three copies or as just one copy, okay? So it, it's really about performance. That's, that's the key here.
and that in fact leads nicely to the, the next slide. So um, the, the number of replicas, whether the object is partitioned or whether it's replicated, or replicated really depends on how it's going to be used. Um, and um, of course, um, there's a, a need to be aware that determining the global state when the object is, is replicated is, is potentially an expensive operation. Okay. So the, the K42 and the design issues, um, it does support both uh, message passing and shared memory, but the implementation um, is actually mostly shared memory, as you would expect, because on a tightly coupled multiprocessor, that is uh, um, uh, usually the fastest way to communicate. Um, replication and caching, so the clustered object thing gives a very nice abstraction for this. Um, and in fact, K42 provides a library of lock-free data structures. So um, um, even when um, clustered objects um, have to, when the instances have to um, share uh, some data between them, um, they, it, you know, they have support for very efficient uh, implementation of that. Um, exploiting parallelism, well, um, of course, um, this was one of their initial goals, that the, the operating system doesn't get in the way of uh, achieving good parallelism. And um, um, the K42 designers actually uh, developed a, a pretty extensive um, and, and very fine-grained, very lightweight tracing infrastructure um, and a bunch of visualization tools to go with it. So they were uh, uh, pretty serious about performance debugging. Okay, I've come to the end. Um, so I've only got one, one concluding slide. Um, I gave you a, a kind of historical perspective on, on uh, a bunch of different operating systems. Uh, as I said at the beginning, um, I hope you, um, I, well, um, I didn't expect you to remember too much of the detail of, of what I told you, but I, I hope you uh, uh, got the message that um, um, whatever the scale is, um, um, systems designers need to understand the trade-offs that are being made, um, especially when the system is distributed, when communication is involved. Um, in the next lecture, uh, I'm, I'm kind of going to move all this into the present day and, and talk about whether we need a, a, a new approach uh, to, to operating system structure on uh, multi-core hardware and, and talk about this uh, uh, research operating system that I was involved in building. But that is it. Are there more questions? I think uh, we can all go. We'll go home. Thank you.